Welcome everyone back uh, for another panel. Uh, for those of you who came to see the panel yesterday, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Today we'll try to enjoy ourselves even more. Uh, can you please uh, welcome the panelists that we have on stage? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Scott, Scott. Miller, um, co-owner of uh, Build Studios with David Byte and Rowan Pitts. Uh, and we have servers, provide technology, and are also a real-time studio. Nice. Hi, I'm uh, Joshua Eason with uh, Meptic, uh, interactive designer with Meptic. We're based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're an experiential design firm. I'm Brett Bolton. I'm a freelance designer, um, mainly for concept visuals from Las Vegas. I do um, interactive installations and also, also have an audiovisual band called Showgirl Video. I'm Matt Swoboda, and I used to work in video games, and then I made Notch. <laughs> Yeah, so for, for this, the context of this conversation, uh, you can think of Matt as three people. Uh, the guy who made video games, then the guy who transitioned to working in the same industry as everybody else on the panel, with the exception of me, and then he made Notch, because we're going to talk, you know, we're going to touch on these topics um, from your past, and in that context, I want you to answer as if you were still doing it create a mental seal between those two worlds. As if I still made content, you mean? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so let's start off with that. Um, I want to talk about Notch and real time in general, how it's affected your process and then primarily your creative process. And since I know that Brett is dying to start, I'm going to start with you. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Basically, I come from an After Effects and some 4D world, like a lot of us kind of did. I uh, did a lot of digital science stuff in Vegas when I was kind of getting started um, doing motion graphics. But um, after kind of meeting JT um, and learning about Notch and kind of doing uh, the rendered content for concert visuals, he kind of showed me Notch and I got really into it. And yeah, basically that changed my entire workflow and hmm. kind of how, changed my career path really. Wow, yeah. okay, so when you, you mean that you, you, you went from one set way of using a tool, like one set set of tools and then got another tool. Yeah, and rendered content to being able to, instead of having keyframes and doing this entire thing for, you know, um, like a time code based, you know, yeah. piece of rendered content, I can actually make these systems that were um, audio reactive, so I can just expose some parameters and kind of let things drive themselves as opposed to making every little change in a piece of rendered content. Cool. Cool. Josh? Um, uh, my background was mostly in, in visual effects, so spending days or if not weeks in render time. I, I think the, the biggest thing of switching to real time with Notch was that now I'm able to quickly test the validity of creative ideas. Even if the idea, you know, I don't finish the idea, Notch, I'm able to start up, start something, gray box it out, see is this thing going to work, is it not going to work, and throw a lot of things away, keep a lot of things, and, and just move a lot more quickly in, uh, in R&D. Like yeah. So I came about this completely backward, I think. So, because I used to work in video games, and I started doing creative projects, but I never used, I never made video. And I never made like a render in all the creative projects I was doing. And then one day I had to do that, and I was like, Jesus Christ, this is horrible. <laughs> like, why would anyone want to make stuff like this? Like, it's not just the fact that it takes ages to render; it's the fact that the files are really big and like everything is super slow like just copying it around or moving everything is suddenly a huge task i couldn't really i didn't really because i always imagined that without ever ever used after effects or anything like that i kind of imagined that it must be better than it is <laughs> so yeah i was really surprised so i've never ha i've never gone i've gone from real time into video and back out and I guess so. <laughs> you met it in the door and it was like, nope, not for me. Not and then back up slowly. Okay. Let's not do that. <laughs> Scott. So I'm, anyone that knows me knows that I'm not actually a creative, but uh, my, my tagline is an engineer for creators. I've got to make it work. And I think when I started in this industry, projection artworks, everything was pre rendered. Everything was, we received a video file on site and we pressed play for that video file. Now what's happened with the real-time world is all of a sudden we have to be much more involved because that video file comes to us with a bunch of exposed parameters that then has to be set up on site. And that whole workflow, as JT was describing yesterday, that pinch point has moved mm. quite a lot now. And that's, it's really affected us opening up a lot of opportunities, but also changing where the, the pressure is on us. 
It's interesting what, like, going on from what Scott said, I think one of the things that this has changed is like previously when you're making content that's just video, it's very tempting for the guy who makes the content to sit in his studio making content on a monitor and rendering it out and sending it to site. And that's the end of their involvement. Like they've made a beautiful video clip that goes some and ends up being something on a stage one day that they don't, you know, they're really interested in that. They're interested in looking at their render. And I think what this has changed is it's brought a lot of those people who used to sit in the studio onto site. It's made them actually come into the room because they're working on stuff that they need to actually tweak in at the end and deal with at the end. And when they're in the room, they suddenly actually are able to work on their stuff in the context. Like they see it with on the LED screens, with the lights on, with the haze on, with the band there. And suddenly they are able to make creative decisions about the whole thing as a, as a whole, not just the, the render back in the studio. And that ultimately, I think, is what leads to much better shows. It's the fact that the creatives are able to do their, are, in, are there to do the job, the right job, rather than the render. See what I mean? And you also don't have to bring an entire render farm to site with you to try and change five frames in the clip that's been pre-rendered days before. Yeah, I guess the process has changed a little bit. Uh, I, I know for a fact that Matt worked on a show back in the show days where there were some rehearsals um, and then they were waiting and then there were new rehearsals. I, I'm trying not to say the name of the show. There was a, yeah, it was a, a large scale arena theater touring production <laughs> <coughs> so that i think this was actually it was quite interesting because they it was like the typical thing content team on site in the dressing room render farm every day they make some content they render it all night the, they put it on the show the director sees it gives them some notes and then they have to do the whole process again for another 24 hours and then the next day comes and they get a new set of notes, which kind of equates to something entirely different from the thing they had before. Because by then, everyone's forgotten what they were looking at. Like, they're not, it's not like they were looking at something and then they changed it. It was like they, they looked at something, forgot everything they looked at, and then saw it 24 hours later and changed their mind. And it meant that those guys never... They, they were always chasing a moving target because they were never actually able to meet at this moving requirement. And when you can actually, if you can just change a few things at the sharp end, then you're able to kind of satisfy someone. It's not, it, maybe it's not even about the result. It's about satisfying the guy asking for you and taking them on the journey. And, they're able to, and then they're able to kind of mentally sign off on making some changes and being happy with what they see. And that's, that's the kind of the difference. So it's kind of like the work has, I think we touched on this in panel yesterday, uh, talking about the client uh, creative uh, relationship, but it's kind of, if you think about something from the idea to the execution, to the end of the execution, there's like a timeline, right? I know we don't like timelines, but there's a timeline. Uh, very few keyframes. Uh, we're taking these keyframes and we're sort of stretching them out. So the area where you would work would previously be here, and now it's suddenly moved maybe closer to the end since you have the ability to affect the outcome and you have the ability to do it on site or with a client in a room and you can make the change. And then that's, as you say, that's person idea, but then it's person idea of a frequency that's higher than once a day. Now you can do it like twice an hour or something like that. Is that a net positive for, for all projects? Or it sounds to me, it's really scary. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was getting if It only about. happens for like an hour, yeah. not yeah. for four days or two months. <laughs> okay, if you're on a tour, like you're gonna eventually have to go on tour. So as deadline gets closer and closer, the clients in there rehearsing all the time, they'll come on site, and if you can change things with them staying right behind you, yeah. <laughs> like someone it's, someone it's, said that yesterday as well in the audience that, um, and if you're watching this on YouTube and you're completely confused, go watch the other panel first. <laughs> we'll be referencing it. Uh, someone said like, well, so my excuse, my render time excuse, has now disappeared. Yeah. And I used to rely on that for safety and mental health. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to be able to tweak things live and be able to, you know, get exactly what the client wants. You yeah. Know? But it's also a bit nerve-wracking if you can't do that right away. You know, you're tweaking things a bit. And like, no, 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 do this. Yeah. So it's like, 
which parts of it can you tweak? Can you expose those parameters to the client? Yeah. Like you can yeah. change where the, the rotation of this and the color of this, yeah. but you can't change <laughs> this into something else. Um, and it's True. that, I guess it's a little bit different than sort of your planning process since you're experimental, not experimental maybe, but experiential, it's a difficult word for me. Um, you actually have to do all of the planning first and then pick the tools, right? Yeah, that's right. And I mean, there's still the aspect of when we get on site, the client's going to see it and they know it's real time. They're still going to say, can we change this? Can we change this? And if it's something that's not too risky to change, then we'll say, sure, because we want to make the client happy. Mm. Um, it, but if it is, then we communicate that and say, well, can we do this instead? Can this, will this, you know, satisfy um, your, your request? Or sometimes we have to say, sorry, you know, it's, it's too late for that. Mm. And just, um, you know, and kind of develop that relationship with the client that we actually can say that. So you mentioned risk. So um, I think JT mentioned yesterday as well, like once you introduce like a interactive or real-time element, you introduce a, a different kind of risk. So what's, what's the nightmare scenario? If you're building a box that does X, Y, and Z, What's the worst thing? And it runs in notch in some part of the chain. What's the worst thing they can ask for? Where you go like, I really don't want to do that particular thing. Is like changing models or upping textures or what? I'd say it's really mostly the, the interactive aspect. Um, I've found one of the hardest things with doing anything interactive is that, that I'm as I'm building something, I'm testing it myself. Mm. Then someone else comes up to it and they test it and you know, I'm, I'm doing like this and they start doing like this. Yeah. And, um, and I, I go, oh, well, you know, what are you doing? I never, I never expected that you're going to start waving your arm at. I thought you're supposed to like kind of poke it. And, and then so I test it with a few other people and I eventually kind of realized, well, everyone does this differently. Mm. And you change something that's interactive and then you, well, all that testing has gone out the window in, in some cases. Um, so it's, it's really about oh, how much impact is it going to have on, on how the interaction takes place. Yeah. That's, I, I'd say, probably the, the scariest thing for me with, uh, with client requests. If it's visual, <laughs> just simply visual color grading or changing yeah. a color, something sure, you know, like that's, that's simple. Cool. Yeah, that's the, the, the classic 80-20 rule. Like when you get it working, you think you put your finger in and it just works, it's finished. But actually you realize that you've done a small amount of the work, but afterwards having to fine tune that and test that. And that's actually where the real time obviously comes in as being very useful because you can fine tune it and tweak it and test it when you get on site. I think just following on from a slightly different angle, a lot of the work I've done is in the corporate world. And I think that's quite an interesting <laughs> opportunity for real time because looking at Gavin and the audience there who I've done a lot of work with, but the, in the corporate world, in the music world, you're dealing with an artist. They are, by their nature, creative. In the corporate world, you're generally dealing with a brand, a company, mm. who are going through an agency. And by the time that you've, they've come to you with a request for some style, you know, it's very disassociated with the brand that they're actually mm. working for. And so all of a sudden, you A, trying to explain this crazy stage or this crazy setup that they're going to get, how they visualize that, how they see how their content is going to look. Then you have to, um, then you get to site and all of a sudden the, the brand, the actual boss from the brand comes along and goes, that's not what I wanted, that's not what I expected. And that to me is quite exciting about the opportunities of real time in the conference world where obviously at the moment we can use it to change name tags and things like that, but really working on actually bringing the creative in and, and giving much more flexibility on site when all of a sudden everyone arrives on site backstage and they want to start tweaking things. So you're saying that um, you need to be clear up front about who actually has sign off on how things looks and feels early on? Is right. a general business tip? I think the way, the way I would put it is like, JT said this quite well yesterday, like you, you don't use real time to make content at the last minute. Like you don't use it to like leave everything to the last minute because that's, that's a terrible thing to do. It still needs design and it still needs just as much time as anything else. I think what it does, it does sometimes get you out of jail. Mm -hmm. if, if the choice is like, if the choice is like doing it properly for, for two weeks or doing it in an hour, you choose to do it in two weeks. If the choice is like, it's going to get canned or you have the ability to fix it, then the ability to fix it is really very handy. And particularly on, on the pop and rock shows, like, 
content gets, and the, the bigger the show, the more it happens. Like content gets cut a lot. <laughs> like, and for the stupidest of reasons. Like if you, you get the sort of dressing room meeting with the band and the band's girlfriend and the band's girlfriend's hairdresser and their best friend and their <laughs> dog keeper and everything like that. <laughs> and, they, uh, and they all sit around and everyone wants to have an opinion because they want to justify their reason for being in the dressing room. And if anyone says, like, I don't like that bit of content, it's, the content gets cut. And it's very difficult, you know, it's really hard to guard against that, especially when you've got this piece of content that you've made lovingly for weeks, and then one day it's, it's just gone. Because, and actually what was needed was, it was cut because someone didn't like a small element of it. And if you have the ability to have a conversation, like, okay, we can change that, look, what, what do you want to see? Let's make some small variations. Okay, now it's, and then they're like, okay, I've had my say now, I'm happy. And that keeps it in the show. Like that's, that's kind of a, a, to be able to do that is, it gets you out of jail. Because the other option is like that two weeks of work's just gone and we never see it again. So, so there's still politics and personalities in shows. And, like people buy from yeah, people, shocking. they don't buy, you know, a brand agency is still like a guy, you know, a couple of people managing their client who are, who are all just shit scared about getting fired <laughs> and not wanting to do the wrong thing. Like those are the people you're trying to, win over. It's the same with you when you do the pop show and you're working with like their, their production team who are shit scared about getting fired because they are offering the wrong opinion of what the artist wants and then the artist walks in and has a completely different opinion than everyone thought. It just, it's still just buying from people and the, able, the ability to satisfy people and take them on a journey is probably, is the invaluable thing in my opinion. So uh, in terms of uh, the technique behind real time graphics, like the, the, the concept of it, the fact that it's, it's by definition just out of the gate, you, you're seeing frames as you make them, you, they are by definition interactive in some way, whether or not you use that. Like um, iMag is like one, say the 2D version of that, where you actually just have an image and you do something with it um, and then into 3D. And I'm thinking specifically of AR, uh, broadcast AR here because it's, it just isn't possible without rendering in real time. Um, we've all seen, I'm sure, some of the, the more publicized uh, versions of this with like Weather Channel did uh, a couple of these extreme cases with the car falling over and the hurricanes and all of that stuff, um, which was broadly well received, but were kind of one-offs. Um, we're seeing more and more TV channels like coming to Austin Arch to ask for like, how can we, how can we make this sustainable? How can we avoid hiring all of you for three months to make the one segment of the show? How can we make it less of a gimmick and less of a one-off and more of a, a steady thing? Um, and I don't think necessarily rendering quality has to something to do with it. I think um, it has to be accepted as a thing. Like people are used to seeing something in, uh, overlaid over something else and mapped into the output. Like we've seen some concerts and stuff where the AR output is the main reception and the 10,000 people in the audience just, they don't see it. Like, is there a disconnect there? Is there gonna be more of it, less of it? Is it a gimmick? If it is a gimmick, what will it take to sort of like break through of that and turn it into something like a household thing? Regular thing. I think in TV broadcast, I, I um, did a small um, sports show for, for ITV, and it was we would we were getting graphics in the ad breaks and having to <laughs> put them into the system and resize them and set them all up. But it was it was it was just in D three, but it was that that whole concept. We were just resizing things to to fit it into screen. But essentially, yeah, we you couldn't pre render anything. Everything was being built in real time. The director was saying, "Oh, I don't like that. Can you change that? Can you change that? Can you change that?" And that that is where obviously when the AR comes in, AR has to be real time. But even even if it's not AR. Uh, if you're just doing normal TV graphics for mm. backgrounds, the ability to do real-time changes is is essential. And I think it is, as I, I mentioned that back the scene, the, these things, these phones have absolutely killed our industry because everyone just expects everything to happen <laughs> instantaneously. Mm. And I think that that's, that's where real-time is. It's a given. It has to happen. The media servers, yeah, we can resize an image on media servers, but it's only inevitably going to go 
onwards that the background that we have pre-rendered on the, the Champions League, that eventually is going to be real time. They're going to want to put different colored flags in the background, in the stands during different teams and things like that. So I think that's a, that's a given that the, um, that the industry is, is going that way. I think on the other point you, you made about how we get AR, how we get real time in, from the broadcast and the corporate world, and probably the same in the music world, it's just the, the education aspect of it. How do, we, how do we educate directors? How do we speak to producers? How do we yeah. get these people who for 10 years, strictly I used yesterday in my example, strictly have done the same thing for 10 years. Content on the floor, content in the LED, people dancing, bit of confetti. Every now and again, a new prop comes in. How do you educate the designers? How do we show them what can be done, what's, all, what's possible? You know, obviously, again, the phone thing, everyone gets, a, gets their phone out, takes a Snapchat with a filter on it, takes an Instagram with a filter on it, and they expect us to be able to do that in two days, not knowing that, obviously, you know, Snapchat's got an army of 100 developers behind the scene. Yeah. So I think on that side of things, the, the real time, I think in the music world, it's a bit more, it's ingrained now and people know about it, but in the, in the corporate world, in the broadcast world, where it's just new, I think that whole, that real education, and as I say, making sure we're all singing from the same hymn sheet and selling the same concepts and capabilities of the software is, is going to be vital in getting the real time into that world. I'd say uh, with the, the AR, AR subject, um, it, it's still in its infancy, so uh, not many people are educated on it, um, including all of us. Um, the tools are still being developed you know, right now. Um, the whole process is, is pretty difficult to set up. It's, it takes a while, and in, you know, in a, a film setting, you know, time is money, so you have to be able to, to move quickly. So I think as designers, we have to educate ourselves on best practices, just like with anything else. Um, but also to communicate our needs to the you know the the, the people who are making the tools that that we use, um, you know the media servers, the tracking systems, you know Notch things like that that are all developing quite quickly. Um, but these all these needs that we're experiencing are are very very new needs, um, and I think as those systems are developed and the the, the use of them becomes easier, um, it'll it'll become more quickly adopted, I, I think so. And um, and then also, ARs are, I think, a really hard thing to make like a temporary setup. You, you really need like AR studios that are like already set up with the trackers, with the screens, with the LED, whatever you yeah. whatever you need, so you can bring in teams, just like we do with, you know, green screen sound stages. Um, it's gonna take the industry to develop these kinds of spaces before I think it really is taken very seriously by the by the industry that's already so well established we have to establish ourselves in that as well. I was, just, I was just having a little thought there. I was like, interesting, at what point, so if someone asked for an AR show now, we have to, as you say, we have to get tracking, we have to get D3 operators, notch operators, and this was where, is there, is there a point in time, is there a single person that can do the creative, can do the D3, can do all the networking, can do all the, where do we stop with this, like... A busy person. Yeah. <laughs> Far too busy person. But it's, a, it's an interesting challenge, like, I would love to do AR shows with two people, but what roles do those two people have to have and skill sets do those two people have to have to go and do it? Otherwise, you're trying to send these guys a, a bill for, you know, five people for three days to do a 10 second skit in the middle of a show. I think with um, with AR, like when you look at projection mapping and you go back like 10, 15 years, like all the projection mapping on buildings was like um, outlines and uh, stuff flying out the windows. Make it crumble. Yeah, and make it crumble. I still like the make it crumble. It's cool. <laughs> but they were all basically just gimmicks. And then it was a few years before anyone actually, and then at some point the gimmicks stopped being cool and people actually started having to do like narrative, interesting stuff with projection mapping. And then it matured uh, into something decent. I think we're gonna see, we see the same thing like when people started affecting iMag heavily, there was a little stage when everyone just really, really heavily affected like particles splodge iMag. And then it matured and then it started becoming content properly. And it's gonna be the same where they are. Like we're gonna go through a real, a real splodgy phase and then it's going to mature and people are actually going to figure out what's interesting and cool and why to do it and then it will be then it will start being like becoming just something that everyone does because you could do something really interesting with it 
we definitely see it in you know watching all of the hashtags, uh, projects that people put out. Like the first things people make with Notch usually has very little subtlety in it. <laughs> it's like that. It's this thing times two hundred. Boom, boom, boom. It's like okay, well, everybody does that as their first thing. So why don't you take a step back, spend a little time with this, and then figure out what your entry in this, into this is going to be. Uh, and to me, that sounds like with every new, if you see something as a toy and you approach it with the first part of the toy, that's the fun part. And then um, I believe, uh, Joshua, you said something earlier about um, maturity, like learning something, that it takes time to get to a point where you feel comfortable. This was in the conversation we had about risk. Um, and Brett, too, you've been using different kinds of tools to get where you are in the concert touring, but also your private projects. I want to talk a little bit about how that differs. Um, if you're the creative and you're the brain and you're the guy with the idea and how you approach that versus say something that comes with you with a fixed brief. Gotcha. Yeah, there's, I kind of have two different worlds that I live in. Um, I've got my personal side, which is all my AV projects, my interactive installations, and my, my band, my AV band. Um, and that's nice because I get to do whatever I want. You know, I can kind of use whatever tool I've got available, Ableton, um, Touch Designer, Notch, all kind of make them talk together and make some weird, like, <laughs> I don't know, system that you wouldn't otherwise think of to use Notch for. Um, I've got that world, but then I also have, I'm kind of like a technician, like for Notch, or I'm like a, a designer, but usually it's like trying to translate the client's needs into what they want, you know, so I can kind of, I'm a conduit for their ideas, which is nice. Um, but yeah, it's nice to go back to my personal projects and be able to kind of dive really deep into different tools and ways to make them interact. But yeah. I like asking Brett because he he's so shy. Yeah. <laughs> Usually pretty quiet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not used to the stage behind a computer like most of us. Yeah. But I want to continue about that. Like not necessarily with you, I'm gonna let you go for a moment. But but the, this whole of approaching the the um, say yesterday we talked about a lot of pop project because of that was the setting of this. So here in the terms of like real time you say you, you, you're a real-time company, you, you make real-time stuff. So obviously you start off the conversation with the client at a different place than with someone who just wants X, right? Where you might determine that real-time is the way to go. Uh, people don't usually come to you unless they know they have to do this, or am I misunderstanding how that works? Well, I think it, it's, it's been very interesting for me because obviously David and, and Rowan, who I work with, have come from a slightly more creative background. And we, were, we started a company just, just under two years ago. We kind of decided, you know, what are we? What are we doing? What are we, you know, what are we putting on our website to describe what we are? And we, we, the guys have been doing notch looks for a long time. But I, you know, we all know how to use C4D and After Effects and bits and pieces. But we kind of realized that actually, yeah, we're a real-time studio. And it's been really interesting chatting to JT and, and other my old company, where it was more of a traditional studio. And it kind of just made me think next door, like we probably, you know, just a few of us now, but we're one of the first kind of just calling ourselves a real time studio. And it, it is upsetting the apple cart a little bit because we, you know, someone comes to us and they have a request and we think, well, can we do this in Notch? Can we, you know, does this sort of fill our bit, fit our bill? And then that conversation is very different because, yeah, we don't have that experience of being a full creative studio and we're kind of learning this new style of of, of doing things and it's it's interesting hearing both sides of the story you know where jt doesn't like when someone says hey can i just have a notch guy for two days we'll quite happily sell someone a notch guy for two days <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's um and it's very interesting hearing all those conversations and and we did a, a snow patrols gig recently where half the show was video half the show was um was real time Personally, my first time being on site on a, on a music show, and it was really interesting working with Lewis, and I think Chris, the, the, um, the chap who'd done all the pre-rendered video, and as Matt says, some of the stuff was, was chucked away because Chris couldn't turn around and, and re-render it. So it was a very interesting experience where, yeah, we did just sell a notch guy for a certain amount of days to pre-make all the videos that had been given a, a brief to us. Then we sent someone on site, and on site, Lewis, uh, there was one video, I believe, was, 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 wasn't liked by the band, 
and an hour later, Lewis had completely rebuilt something. Now, it may not have had the full polish of a pre-rendered video with all that thought and process into it, but by this time, Lewis had been working with the band and the video guy for a couple of days. He knew the style, he knew the vibe, and he could just put together a look in two hours that was, is still being used on the tour. So it's, been, it's quite interesting. I feel like we're upsetting it a little bit. I feel a bit of a fraud because I didn't come from that background, but all of a sudden now I run a real-time studio and we're selling notch and doing cool things with it. So it's quite exciting. Well, to sure. be fair, if I wanted to put image filters on video, I could make my own real-time studio and call myself a real-time wireless, right? Yeah, what, why not? I'm not going to do that, it that, because the, I don't want to upset you know, his apple cart. And, but... it's, it's, and that's... And, I, I'm, very, I'm very interested that the AR thing is something we've picked up. I yeah. come from a technology background, so that's something I've really made happen now. And I, I, I'd like to think that we're one of very few that have the, you know, people can come to us and we have the confidence to make it happen. And we're trying to drive that forward now. And yeah, no, it is. But well, there's a lot of freelancers out here who will go and do a full creative show for a band without any, anyone else's involvement. So, this so I have a request on this topic. Okay. And this is a request to everybody in the audience as well. Let's not ever call anyone a notch operator ever <laughs> again. <laughs> Let's call them notch designers. <laughs> yes. Because that's what it is. It, we're notch designers. You're not a guy, you're not like operating a drill <laughs> or uh, operating heavy machinery. You come along and you have to design something. You're not an operator, you're a designer. So, and I think if we can go and kill the term notch operator, it will go a long way to framing what the job is. Even if it's a notch designer who's booked for a couple of days, at least the idea is correct in people's minds. Yeah, it has Sorry, no Matt. <laughs> Apart from Scott, who can still be <laughs> Scott, the one Scott. notch operator yeah, yeah. in existence. <laughs> He'll get all the gigs. Um, so <laughs> yesterday, we talked, uh, we asked the audience uh, um, what their sort of like beginning comfort level and I think for this one we'll ask a slightly different question which is um, are you or are you going into uh, a team setting with Notch or are you going at it alone so if you're going at it alone or want to go at it alone could you please raise your hands all right I know that's not exactly true because you work with teams all the time so I'm gonna do half the hand <laughs> for you but that's almost nobody wants to be the Notch operator clearly in the audience. Wait until it's we get... Good, uh, it's not a good job. We need to get multi-editing on the notch blocks to do teams. Let's not so do feature requests because operators. we'll be this here all day. <laughs> Army of notch operators. Because <laughs> it's actually like the, being the guy, it's like being a flame operator. Like saying, it's uh, like... Does it sound like a notch programmer? No. <laughs> <laughs> notch designer, please. <laughs> like, be, like being a, it's like sitting on... So the idea of a notch operator is you're like sat in a chair running notch with everybody in the room shouting at you while you try and design something on a big screen with everyone looking. Not a good job. So um, on that sort of sort of topic, um, since everything had this certain look with this, any type of tech you bring it in, it has this first look like for iMag, for concerts and stuff, you put filters on it and so and so. Um, for real time, graphics then, not necessarily interactivity part of it, but for, for something that's rendered in real time, is there a current look? Like I know that a lot of Notch stuff has a look because everybody throws like the film grade on it and don't adjust the chromatic aberration, which you should all turn off or at least reduce because the default is too high, feature request. Um, <laughs> but is there a certain look or a certain thing that everyone does the first time they go from, say you go from something like with a fixed timeline animation and then you get into it. Obviously, I'm just gonna take credit for this, Particles, it's very popular. I think that's not necessarily because uh, people like Particles, but it's because they like to make them, if that makes sense. It's very easy to get something that looks hard to do in very few steps. Um, and how do you take that as a concept? Like you were talking about, like we take the brief and then we try to make something interesting. How do you take something that's seen as a technology or, or a way of doing something and actually use it where it makes sense? Um, particles, one thing. I've made my fair share of particles, definitely. Yeah, everybody has. <laughs> I, I'm not knocking no, particles. No, 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 yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah. I made lots of particle looks, a lot of glitch looks, of, you know. Yeah, glitch looks yeah, and, it's, it's and particles. Yeah. But uh, I think 
definitely where we can take notch further too is that, like JT's worked with this a bunch is using like set extensions and like incorporating IMAG and um, the artist face into like 3D content. So be able to use interactive. Uh, Armin did a talk on this earlier too. Being able to incorporate the traditional IMAG inside these 3D worlds that you can manipulate live. I think that's kind of where I see IMAG going and using that as a next step over just making glitches and particles. But I guess that kind of follows on because um, you can only do set extension when you're in the room. True. You have to actually be on set. Yeah. And I guess those kind of those kind of, it's cool that it opens up those kind of possibilities where you have to you have to be sat in the room and you have to set it up and you have to just see it as a set. In terms of a like a standard notch look that you know everyone sees sees and talks about, you took you know the chromatic aberration on the side <laughs> of black background particles. Um, I I've been approached by clients before who go like, hey, I don't know if we want to use notch because it all just looks the same. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> It's, I mean, when you open it up, there's a black background and people are like, oh, I'm, I'm going to make something in this black void of space. <laughs> I, I could in, would encourage anyone using Notch to like, don't start with that. Go find photographic reference, go find, you know, a mood board, Pinterest, something and go like, okay, I want to create something that's like this and, and, and shoot towards a, a goal rather than just going, okay, I'm going to make something in Notch. Yeah. And, and I think that'll help the everyone have more variety in their work. And I think that also helped to kind of increase uh, quality in the, in the community. So I, I, I'll ask a question to you two then. If you are given a brief or you come up with a brief yourself, how do you solve it? How do you go about satisfying it? Like if we're given like a reference image and then figure it out, um, I guess multiple ways. Like it's, it's really fun to do. I kind of like getting a reference image and be like, okay, how do we go about this? What kind of interactive components can you incorporate to make it happen. Um, definitely there's been times where in, like Smash around U2, like when we were doing U2 where he'd be like, I like this I like this image, let's do this. And I'm like, uh, okay. And then you have to sit down and figure out what components, is there an overlay? Is there some kind of grain that you need to put in it? Is there some kind of extrusion that needs to happen based on luminance? And like, yeah, it's. Uh, do you think it's different? Sorry, I'm derailing. Yeah, this now. was always yeah. going to happen, so it's fine. <laughs> So, Nobody was under the illusion that I was going to controlling the conversation. It's fine. <laughs> Good. Uh, so I guess the question I was going to the question is like, does the way you problem solve or fit a brief change if you're making something like just for making a piece of rendered content? Does it is it different doing it in Notch to doing it in like C40 After Effects, and how, or is it the same? I, I'd say it, it is different because I mean there are technical restraints, especially if you're. Well, if, if it needs to run back in real time, then there's definitely constraints of, of FPS. If it's if it's not, then not as many constraints, because uh, who cares about FPS at that point? Um, I still prefer that whenever I'm making video that it still runs back at 30, because I can just visualize it better. And so I, I kind of just make that my personal standard. Um, but I mean, when a client reaches out and says, we want you to make this, or whenever you know I'm approaching any kind of um, uh, any kind of project, I, I look at it and I go like, okay, well, is this really easy to do a notch? Um, if it's if it is, great, do the whole thing in notch. If it's not, then I go, well, should I um, do the animation outside of notch in Cinema 4D or Maya or something like that and then import it? Maybe, maybe that's a great option. Or maybe the option is to do pre-rendered content and treat it in notch. It's, I mean, there really is no, like, I think, set answer. It's more about, like, how much time do you have? What does the client want? Um, how easy or hard is it to do? And you kind of have to just kind of tailor every single project, every single thing that you do to to meet those design constraints. Usually I'm hired on as a notch designer. Good. So. Well done. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're safe. <laughs> yeah, this time anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so usually my like I'm, I'm there just to do not stuff a notch, but um, yeah, definitely having the right tool for the job makes sense. So I guess when I was doing these more of these kind of projects, um, the, I think the thing for me was that say you got a brief that was a certain yeah, that someone wanted to achieve a certain effect, like a like a fluid effect or a smoke effect or something. There, that was the kind of look. I think the difference for me was that I would just try all the ways really quick, rather than trying to figure out the right way up front and do it. I would just like try all of them and see what looked best, and then blend them together because you could try a lot of things quickly. I guess that was what made, that was the difference in approach that it gave for me. 
So uh, we're obviously like everyone here, maybe with the exception of you, <laughs> have made a lot of stuff in, in Notch. And um, at least for me, when I started doing real time graphics, not in Notch, but on the Amiga like 20 years ago, the thing that it like really that that lit the the spark for me was sort of like, oh, I can just I can just change everything at, at the same time. And then I would start to get Amiga graphics jobs changing things. And from that point, I was kind of hooked. So it might be a little bit different for you, but do you find yourself actively seeking out jobs that allow you to use this workflow? Because at the end of the day, if you spend eight hours doing something, you might as well spend them doing something interesting that or fulfilling, I guess, is what I'm asking. Or is it a different thing? Like, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. You're happy either way. I mean, I, I really enjoy working in real time, really enjoy working with Notch. and. The more time I've spent in it, the easier it's become, the more I enjoy it. Um, so I, I'd say if a client came to us and they said, hey, can you make this? It's pre -render, they're expecting pre-rendered content. Uh, we would say, yeah, we can definitely make that. Um, you know, Love what you got there. But then gently suggest to them some other options to maybe kind of, kind of add on the what else can we do on top of it. Um, to bring them back to our preferred workflow, which would be in Notch. <laughs> okay. And in a lot of cases, they go, oh, what, you can do that? And then we say, yeah, 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 that would, yeah we definitely can. Um, and then they not only let us do what we want to do, then they, a lot of times, then open up and give us more control over the creative process because we've kind of, you know, we've made them excited about it. So you're saying, like, Notch is like sugar at a kid's birthday party? Certainly can yeah, be. like a lot of cake. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, um, I think we should open up the floor to some questions as well. If you're thinking about something you want to ask any of these fine gentlemen, uh, please raise your hands. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can hackle a little bit. From a designer standpoint, how do you guys deal with speaking about specifically real-time design? Something I've noticed is um, iterations, and not just so easy. How do you control that iteration and then finally the something totally different direction you're supposed to go? Or how do you also find, like, coming back to something like, oh, can you go back five steps and hire like a whole other planet? Um, just because real time, you know, you can just, yeah. you can just, just jam with it. So how do you guys deal with how does it change your design process? How do we deal with infinite iterations? Um, <laughs> usually you have a really good uh, screens producer that manages expectations. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, that's usually, the managing expectations is probably um, the best way to go about it. And also having uh, deadlines to someone to, to like, say also file save yeah. as is good oh yeah, yeah. Uh, regularly early on i i asked luke malcolm the kind of that that question he he told me save your file underscore a1 <laughs> and then a2 a3 a4 a5 and then you get to your client revision switch to b switch the letter and i've started doing that and i the numbers go up quite high the letters eventually go up quite high but then I always have, you know, I can always go back if I if I need to. And I mean, you always save with any project with any software. That's that's definitely the case. But in terms of managing client expectations, I mean, when a client says, "Hey, we need you to do this," um, how long is it going to take? You know, we realistically think, okay, how long is this going to take? Add a little bit extra time because you know something probably will go wrong, or someone's going to show up in the office just to say hey or something like that. Um, and then you you know you tell them. You set that expectation of, okay, we'll have it to you by then. In a lot of cases, if you're working off-site in an office, you can kind of manage that better. When you're on-site, you still kind of have to do the same thing. They're going to say, hey, so we really want you to change this. And you go, okay, great. I can do that. It's going to take me X amount of time. Give them a realistic answer. Put a little buffer in there for yourself for safety. And then deliver. But you know that requires to really know the tool, to know how long something actually is going to take. And you know just keep experiment, experimenting until you are comfortable with giving those answers quickly. All right, in the back. Do you see a trend happening um, where the client, in, due to a real-time world, sits next to you and tells you about uh, how they want the look and you rather become a notch operator than a notch uh, designer? Uh, uh, not yeah, 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 but, but when the client sits next to you and tells you the button set you need to push to make the look, how much is it still your design, or how much is it the stupid thing that the, that the client tells you? L let's think about a black metal band, and all of a sudden the manager comes in and thinks uh, unicorn running all over the stage would be a good idea in rainbow colors. You know, this is 
and you just push the button to make a unicorn run across the black metal stage. I, I'd, I mean, this is a it's really more theoretical or conceptual, or, but it's there's a, there's a big difference between being an artist and being a designer. You know, an, an artist you're making art based on what you want to make. A designer you're, you're designing for someone else. You're designing for a client. It really doesn't matter what I think. You know, it doesn't if a, if they say, "Hey, make a unicorn," and I want it to be pink, and I'm like, "Oh, I'm really partial to blue." My preference doesn't matter. So I give the client what they want, and then for my personal taste, I you know I make notch projects at home when I have time, and that you know that that scratches that itch. But in terms of what the client wants, I give the client what they want. Do you then feel like you become the designer? It's it's still it's still design because a, a designer has to know how to use the tools, how to how to create something. Um, I mean, my my background being in in visual effects, those visual effects. Are, you know, artists, you, I mean, you call them artists, but really they're saying, they're being told, hey, you need to make this alien, he needs to look exactly like this concept, and, you know, he's got to look believable. There, there is no, there's no opinion in that other than, you know, I mean, you do have maybe your, your, the touch of your hand, you know, like how, you know, how, how do you, like if a painter, you know, is going to have a wider stroke or a thinner stroke. So, I mean, you do have your touch that gets put on, and that's going to be inevitable. But in the end, if the client goes, well, hey, I didn't, I didn't like that, can you change it? You just you just change it, and you're still a designer. You're still the one who has to know how to use the tool. It's just, you know, that's that's the world we live in. I think that that's a problem, regardless of notch or not. It's like it happens with everything, video and everything. I remember very early on when I started doing music touring, I went on a show, and a much more experienced uh, guy on that show grabbed me and pushed me against the wall and said, "Look, this is how it's going to go. <laughs> we're going to be here for a, we're, we're going to be here for a while." And everything we do is going to get cut, and it's going to keep getting cut. And the show is going to be what's on there at the point we all go, everything goes on stage. So we need to deliver our stuff so that the best stuff we deliver is like five minutes before the deadline, because that's what's going to be in the show. This is going to be a journey. And that's good advice. <laughs> I think that's good life advice in general. <laughs> all right, we have time for one more question. Yes. Affecting the so the question is how do we see real time affecting the concept process like before you start making the actual assets and yeah that's a good question I don't know I I'm going to take that one from a slightly more technical side of things and actually for me it's really good having the ability and notch to build a look quickly because generally the systems that we're building on these shoes now are huge we've got black tracks tracking we've got other systems we've got information coming in. And all of a sudden, you know, we generally will sit down, we'll plan what the show's going to be. We'll say to the creative people, right, this is your framework that you're going to build your creative in. If we've got to wait a week, two weeks to get that first iteration back to then plug it in and see how it looks and how the interactivity works, et cetera, et cetera. If it doesn't work, we have to change something. We've just lost two weeks. So from, from my point of view, on the technology side of things, having that real-time workflow at the very, very start means that all of us are working in parallel. We're not kind of setting something up, waiting for the first bit of content to come in. Then we go, oh, we've got to rethink it, rebuild it, and then it kind of stops, starts. So I think that being able to do things in parallel um, at the same time is a huge, huge benefit for us from the technology side of things. I think Knots is a really good broad strokes sketching tool. It's, you can make something that looks roughly kind of vaguely what you want really, really quick. The, the actual process of making something good takes as long as it ever did because you have to sit and refine and refine. But the bit at the beginning or when you're just like throwing stuff down to see how it looks and trying stuff out, it's really quick. So I think it's actually a good concepting tool in itself. So we go out on the note that the founder of Notch says that Notch is a great product <laughs> and it's good <laughs> for the things you're using it for. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's not going to get any better than that. Okay, give it up 